Okay. My name is Michael Cloud. I'm going to be your MC for a couple minutes, and we're turning it over to Carl Howell, someone who actually knows what she's doing. <laughs> what we're doing here is going to be a lot of fun for you, and I want to suggest something to you as you leave the room at the end of the seminar. The people who get really good at this and get to the point where the news media knows that when they call you for an interview, that you're running things. And I'm not just doing that for the children. I'm doing that because it helps these people grow spiritually. If they have libertarians running the discussion, they're going to be talking about our stuff. And that's what exactly what Carl Howell is going to teach you how to do. I've seen people go through this and within a month or two look two to three times as good as they did before. With just a few minor tweaks. It's not like you have to change your whole personality, go to the Carnegie course, go get deprogrammed or anything like that. It really works well. Now let me introduce our speaker. I've known our speaker for a number of years, and she's one of the most terrific libertarians I've ever met. Libertarian candidate for auditor in uh, Massachusetts in the late 90s. Got endorsed by the Boston Herald. Uh, got a little over 5% of the vote, gave the party permanent, uh, pardon me, major party ballot status. Went on to run in the year 2000 for U.S. Senate against Teddy Kennedy. <laughs> and did so well that we got national news coverage, so well that the Republican was only eight-tenths of one percent ahead of our libertarian candidate. Wow. And as a consequence, we started getting taken very, very seriously. She went on to run three ballot initiatives. Uh, I was her co-chair, and they were two of them were to end the income tax, and the third one was to slash the sales tax. Each time we ran a ballot initiative, she was our spokesperson. She got better and better. Our votes went up and up and up to the point where the teachers unions out of New York spent $12 million to defeat our ballot initiative to end the state income tax. That's the impact that a good candidate can have. That's the impact leadership can have. And it's one of the reasons that I'm a super fan of Carl Howe, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Who's right? A game that I created to fulfill two very important needs for the Libertarian Party and our spokespersons. Two things that we don't do very well. And by the way, by the way no candidates in any party do well. But it's especially important for us because we're coming from the outside and we're up against ominous forces, which includes the media, our opponents, incumbent politicians, government workers, and all variety of special interests that are working against us to make numbers bigger. So, by the way, can you hear me okay back there? No problem here? Okay. I may, may slip on the way here. So there's two things that this is designed, this game is designed to do, which we're going to play a little later after I give you some background information. And that is that we need to learn to not just talk philosophy about libertarianism, but to put specific proposals on the table for how we shrink government. Specific taxes that we cut, specific regulations or entire bureaucracies that we eliminate. The war on drugs, the war on whatever that we eliminate. Bringing troops home, getting out of foreign wars, reducing the military, reducing all budgets. Anything that turns government. We need to be putting specific proposals on the table. The reason we need to do that is for what we make them possible when we talk about it. Right now, in most people's minds, government is just here to stay. Can't fight City Hall, nothing certain but death and taxes, right? We need to change that. And the way we change it is by simply saying, we actually can end the income tax. We can end the war on drugs. We can close all foreign military bases. We can do it because we said so. Why do we have big government? Because our opponents said so. And they said it over and over and over again. They've been drumming it into our heads our entire lives. Things start to become possible when we talk about it. And as Michael mentioned, our ballot initiative, the first time we rolled it out, when I first ran on it, when I ran for US Senate and new governor, it was a wild, radical idea. By the time we ran our third ballot initiative, I would go on the radio to do an interview, and the callers would do it for me. They would be calling in saying, yes, cut that tax, those crooks, and then they'd go on and they'd give examples of government waste, and I would just sit there and listen, because we just kept pumping it out and repeating it. 
Things become possible just because you say them. What a lot of libertarians get stuck in is simply waxing philosophical, if you will. Or they get stuck in talking about what's wrong with big government. We're, we're all very smart. We've read white papers and books, and we know all about what's wrong with government. And if you want to mention that quickly, we need to point out the contrast. Our opponents voted to put these programs in place that do a great deal of damage. We need to then immediately, quickly follow that up with, and so the solution is to get rid of these failed, dangerous, destructive programs. Eliminate them so that we're safer, more prosperous, more jobs. The other thing that libertarians often neglect to do is talk about the benefits of these programs, as I just gave you an example. Jobs, safety, prosperity. So what we need to do is not just put our proposals on the table. You often see a libertarian say something, and I would eliminate that. I'm done. Right? You say, and we need to eliminate the income tax because that will give back an average of $11,525 every year to the average taxpayer all across the country. $11,525 every year that they can spend or save or give away, that they can use to put their kids through college or retire their debt, their credit card debt, or their student loans, save for their retirement, fix that broken furnace or those drafty windows in their home, take their family on vacation with them promising but just couldn't afford it, been putting off for years. You need to actually visualize how people visualize these things. Because remember, we're all living in a world of big government propaganda. Non-stop big government propaganda. The best opportunity to turn that around is a libertarian candidate. Because that's what they listen to us the most when we're running for office. But it also is true when you're just talking amongst yourselves or talking to friends. You need to make it real for them how this isn't just some idea, how their lives will be better when we end the war in Why will a, a, mom, a soccer mom with teenage kids, who she's praying never get into drugs, who hates drugs and doesn't do drugs, why should she care if we end the war on drugs? She thinks it sends the right message to keep drugs illegal. And then if we legalize them, her kids might be tempted to try them. She's scared. How do you convince her? Well, you point out to her that when we end the war on drugs, first of all, it is utterly failed. And in fact, prohibitions have shown alcohol and drug prohibition have shown that dangerous use of drugs and substances actually goes up under the prohibition. When you get rid of the prohibition, just like when you want to kill it, the alcohol prohibition, the incidence of alcohol drug, drug over death, over, over do, do, deaths went down. As we have seen in Colorado, in Portugal, other parts of the world where they decriminalized or legalized drugs, they've actually, people have become actually more responsible users. Drugs are labeled, you know what you're getting. In Washington State, you see a, a, a cannabis product and it says five milligrams of cannabinoids and THC. You know exactly what you're getting. Whereas when it's illegal, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what it's laced with or anything else. It's dangerous. Above all, crime goes down. Your streets are safer. People don't get held up at ATM machines because they need a fix and they need to get a drug at a high street price. They can go to CVS civilly and purchase it. Now, we don't encourage drug use. Obviously, drug use can be very dangerous. But drug use gets worse under prohibition. If we want to see fewer drug problems, fewer, less addiction, we need to get rid of the more drugs. You see how that speaks to that voter? Right? We're, we're putting ourselves in their shoes. We, so we need to talk benefits to the voters in their terms. We need to put our specific pro proposals out there, and then we need to de demonstrate what the benefits of them are. Does that make sense? So the way we play this game is, and uh, Michael's going to go for some more materials for it. We don't have enough of these cards yet for the whole room, but hopefully more will arrive. So we're going to sort of ration these out for the time being. Um, what we're going to do is have as many people as possible get take up a pair of these cards, red and yellow. And uh, maybe we'll do one per row or something like that. If you would like any amount, please I'm gonna distribute them around the room. Give the people who will really do it. So if you're somebody who, I'm going to play this game and be good about pulling your cards as I instruct you to, raise your hand so he knows that you're one of those people. Because we need the people who will use the cards so we can play the game properly. Yeah. Save a few for this side of the room. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Uh, so, I'll shoot. Thank <laughs> you.
the state budget is $200 million uh, short. We have a shortfall, and we need to close that gap. How are we going to close that gap? And you can respond and say, well, first of all, there's not a shortfall. There's just flagrant overspending going on by our politicians, our Democratic and Republican politicians. Not only do we then have to break that down and stop overspending money they don't have, we actually need to eliminate the income tax. We can probably get rid of the sales tax. I mean, New Hampshire doesn't have either a sales tax or an income tax. And cut spending across the board and get rid of some of the hundreds of bureaucracies in our state that are doing nothing that's ever reported. Uh, they're not accountable to anybody. And almost all of these functions are better served in the private market. So what I did there was I took their wanting me to talk about how to close the budget and say, uh -huh. no, not only do we do they need to just stop overspending, but let's carve out another 50% of the budget. Changing the game, okay? Going on the offense instead of defense. When we play defense against our opponents, the very best that can happen is we win and government stays big. When we go on the offense, the very worst that can happen is we lose and government stays big. Okay, but we open up the possibility of if not winning, moving, moving the bar, opening up the conversation and creating a possibility for less government. Again, this is done by putting out specific solutions for less government. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so let's see here. We also have at the very back of the packet, if you come up here to do, um, to be, we're going to do mock interviews where one person is the libertarian being interviewed and one's the interviewer, journalist. You can use these two pages on the back for sample interview questions. And this is good to have. If you're a candidate, you want to take all these questions and develop your answers to it. You be ready to have them roll off your tongue. And you want to add in this list. There may be a lot of issues specific to your race, right? By the way, how many of you expect that you will never run for office or be a spokesperson for the party? You're more of a behind the scenes kind of person. The shy type who won't raise their hands. <laughs> I saw about five hands go up. Um, this is important for you too, because we need, first of all, we just need to have this conversation everywhere, even amongst ourselves. We should be not just sitting around writing about big government, but talking about getting rid of it. The other thing you can do is support our candidates. So if you see a candidate in your state whose website doesn't have any specific solutions, have a nice conversation and say, hey, you know what? I love what you're doing. You got I know you love liberty, and so do I. I have some suggestions for you. And tell them about this game. Tell them about some specific ideas or how they can take their ideas and turn them into specific solutions. And then talk to them about how they can stand on the benefits of those solutions. Put them in the website. Put them in the rhetoric. Okay? So, thank you, Michael. Who else does it do? Well? Now, one thing we need to cover quickly here before we start to actually play the game is. Um, Ten criteria that make your libertarian solution, your solutions both libertarian and sellable. If you're running for, say, governor, you don't want to propose bringing the troops home because you don't have the authority to do that if you're governor. Or cutting the local property tax unless the laws in your state allow you to directly affect and set local property tax rates. You want to propose things that you have the authority to do if elected. A lot of libertarians don't do that. So you got to, just to be credible, you need to do that. Um, you want to make sure you're putting out a proposal that's bold enough that you can translate it into benefits. For example, imminent domain. If you happen to live in a town with a pretty good pipeline through or a railroad and there's a lot of news around it and a lot of people who are having their properties taken, it may be appropriate in that situation to talk about going after imminent <coughs> domain, repealing it. But for most people, in my experience, they don't even know what it is. And, they, and the chances of it affecting them is about 0.1%. It's not a burning issue in their lives. They don't vote on eminent domain, okay? Except for in some relatively rare cases. Ending the state income tax affects a lot of people. Ending the war on drugs, not as much, but it still does because of the crime element. It, is, it has a dramatic effect on crime and a bunch of other things too. Um, repealing regulations on business creates jobs. <coughs> who doesn't know 10 people who need a job or a better job today, if not 50 people, okay? 
Um, there's a lot of things that affect jobs, government spending, taxes, and regulations. And there's a lot of that to be gotten rid of. So the bolder you make it, the more your benefits. When we ran on ending the state income tax in Massachusetts, we were able to save up and give back an average of $3,500 every year back into the family budget of every taxpayer in the state. $3,500 every year, we kept repeating. $3,500, we put on the bumper stickers, on the yard signs, $3,500. And our opponents hated it. And they attacked us on it because they knew it sold. People care. People need the money, okay? So, bold, broad appeal that appeals to a lot of people. Keep it simple. Many libertarians come up with solutions that are complicated, but that involve, well, I'm running for this office, but when I change the law here, that's somehow going to convince the politicians over there to change their laws there, and then someday, somehow, people will get a tax cut. No, you want to come up with something very direct that you can show that if it's enacted, this is how it will result for you, Mr. Voter, Ms. Voter. Okay, now, once you have a solution that's broad, easy to explain, big benefits, appropriate to your level of government, you need to sell it. What you want to do is quickly contrast yourself with your opponents by pointing out that your Democratic and Republican opponents voted for these laws to the degree it's true. You know, you want to do your research and find that out. Or they support, support it, or they've gone on record opposing whatever it is you have to point to. They want to keep your taxes high. They voted to jack them up. They want to keep big government spending high. They hand out favors to their special interest pals. I want to end the income tax. So you're, you're showing, you talk about what's wrong with government. You maybe make a few quick points about how it's making jobs more scarce, you know, a few damaged, uh, the damaging effects of big government. Then you put out your proposal, a specific reduction in government. It's also very important to add what you will specifically do. If elected, I will co-sponsor legislation too. I will propose a budget that does. I will pardon and free uh, or grant clemency to Edward Snowden and welcome him home. I will order the troops out of the Middle East as, as the commander in chief. You want to lay out specific actions you will take that really puts you on the line and shows that you're serious Again, your opponents won't touch it with a 10 foot pole because that's not what they're there for. They're there to keep big government big. So you want to put out what you're going to do, pledge specific actions you'll take, and then you want to talk benefits, benefits, benefits. Okay? So it's kind of like an infomercial. I watch infomercials with great interest now. I mean, <laughs> but listen to them. Listen to them when you hear them and count how many benefits they fit in in a two minute commercial. Benefit, 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 they just roll them out. But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, and that's how they sell it. And you know, I sit there watching them and go, hey, yeah, do we need a non slip hand? <laughs> you just say it to people enough. You say $3,500 back in your family budget. You can bet there's going to be a lot of people going, So do your neighbors. That's, That's a big right. deal with a lot of people. Three thousand five hundred dollars for you, everyone you love, your neighbors, your coworkers, your employees, all Imagine the people in your life. Imagine everybody spending that in the economy this year. Pardon me. Imagine everybody spending that in the economy this year. Huge, huge. Now that is real economic stimulus. What my opponents call economic stimulus is taking your money instead of you spending it in the economy, giving it to their friends for them to spend it in the economy. And when they do that, everybody's wealth goes down. What we're talking about is sustainable, productive, private sector jobs that result from investment in the private sector by virtue of people keeping the money they earned and investing it where there's a real demand for it in the marketplace. That's real, sustainable, economic growth that doesn't cost taxpayers a dime. In fact, it gives them back a lot of money. Okay? So, um, so that's how we sell our solutions. Now, all right, now the way we play the game is we have two chairs up here. Mike, could you help me move this table out of the way and get two chairs right here? 
probably need to leave that there because I'm sure they need it for them. Okay. All right. We'll just move it up a little further here. Sure. We'll leave it right there. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll do a few demos in a moment here. Sorry, what we'll do is we'll set the timer. Have someone who's got a smartphone with a timer who'd be willing to be our timer. Or if you've got a dumb phone that can count. <laughs> focus of this 
we don't have time here to become experts in that. That's something you have to work on and prepare for each of your individual campaigns and solutions. All right, so um, let's see. What else do I need to mention before we start? Okay, so we're gonna do a demo, and uh, we're gonna do two demos. Ask me the same set of questions each time if you can. Okay. And try to distract me a little bit. I'm gonna do it on the state income tax because I know you're familiar on that. You've got your talking points. Uh, yeah, side. that's what I'm going to do. Okay. okay. And I'm going to be judge, judging myself. Oh, the point I forgot to so What often happens in these is that the conversation meanders, and it gets hard to tell, are we still talking about the proposal or not? And then you ask yourself, do I remember what the proposal was? If you can't even remember, then you're not driving anymore. Okay? You, people, you need to just keep putting it out there. Continually, so people remember and the income tax and the income tax and the war on drugs, whatever it is, say it over and over again. All right, so who's our timer here? Somebody? Okay, we'll do three minutes, but for the demo, we'll just do two minutes. Okay, so just tell us when to start. We're having trouble um, making our budget, um, we've got a budget shortfall, and you're talking about. Cutting the income tax, right? can can we afford that? Well, we we have to. Um, first of all, the shortfall. I don't know who you're hearing that from. Probably the, the the speaker of the house, because there isn't really a shortfall. I mean, the shortfall is because they're they're overspending. They should be balancing the budget. They shouldn't be spending money we don't have. We're not the federal government. Well, our schools are in awful shape. If we don't keep collecting that money, how are we going to fund the kind of teachers we need in schools well, actually, and programs? We actually have plenty of money for the schools. If you look at our schools, they're actually, the, the schools that are spending the most money are our city schools that are actually putting out the worst results. We have low graduation rates, low literacy rates. The money is not the answer. And we've been throwing money at education. But in the income tax, it won't get take police off the street and shut down firehouses and make us less safe and no emergency well, services? Well, ending the income tax, no, it won't do that because we have plenty of police already. And if we end the war on drugs, which is causing us to need far more police than we actually do, then we'll have all the money we need to protect people, um, guard our streets, enforce our necessary laws. So we can, we can end the income tax. That, that's not what I'm hearing from all of our state legislators. It's not just a matter of a Democrat or a Republican, but they all seem to agree that they really need more money to be able to educate our kids and keep our streets safe. And you say that you're going to cut their no, money. No, we don't need more money. That's what they say, have been saying for 20 years. We don't need, we don't need more money. We, you know, and they're not even balancing their budgets. I mean, imagine if we were, as if, if families operated as irresponsibly, okay. I want you to ask me um, more standard questions like, why are you running and so forth? Sure. Assume that I'm not even bringing up what I'm running out of. Okay. Now, in that example, um, what percentage of the time was, did I put the yellow cards in the air? 10%. I mean, I made some legitimate points, but I wasn't advancing the bar. I wasn't moving the bar most of the time. He brought it up. So I, I actually wanted him to not do that because that's not what typical art do, unless you've already publicized your proposal a lot, then they'll lead it for you, okay? But normally they don't. Normally you've got to bring it up. Okay, so well, this time... As a, as a candidate running for this, yeah. I took the initiative. Don't take the initiative. Okay, Just fine. be a typical, typical report, okay? okay? So we're going to do another demo for two minutes. Okay, I have to dumb down. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have been so nervous. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Allen, you're running for governor. Why? I'm running for governor to end the income tax in the state. The state is spending $20 billion on the books, another $17 billion off the books. We need maybe $5 million to run this over the project. $5 billion dollars that, out of that? that? Have you ever spent any time actually looking at the state budget? I can tell you most of it's incomprehensible. It's not. The police, fire schools, and roads, that, that accounts for maybe $2 billion of that entire budget. Almost nothing. The rest of this bureaucratic waste, we're going to get rid of that waste. And when we end the income tax, that's going to give back an average of $3,500 per 
every year to every family in this state. Yeah, but we got 700,000 kids. How can you educate 700,000 kids with just a billion dollars? That doesn't sound like near enough. We can cut education spending. We do not need the state subsidizing our local cities and towns. All that money should be raised and spent locally where communities, teachers, and families can <coughs> control their own education. We stop, we, the, the state stops forcing up property taxes by imposing mandates on the local governments. We get rid of that and we, we, we say, let the local communities control their schools. If you look at actual educational outcomes throughout the state, there's almost an inverse correlation between the number, the amount of dollars spent per pupil and the educational outcomes. Yeah, but most of the money. money throwing money in education doesn't work. That's what we gotta stop doing it. We gotta stop doing it for the kids. But, it's the wrong thing to do to kids, and it sends them the wrong message, too. But, but wait it's, a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. We're giving more money to, to kids in schools that are ghetto schools. These are disadvantaged kids, latchkey kids, kids that both parents aren't at home. That, of course we're going to spend more money there. And that's why they know it's a joke, and they're so disenfranchised. Are we at time? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah. So, you know, that one got keep <laughs> through drew me on to some other issues, and I, I let it go there. You know, you could be even more disciplined about staying with any of the income tax. Um, but you see the difference, the qualitative difference in that? That's what we need to be doing. Yes. And we need it, we need it to make it memorable, and we need to throw out the benefits. Now, what <coughs> benefits do you remember me saying? $3,500 per family. $3,500, any other benefits? Could have been on another Better topic. Education outcome. Better education outcome. Plenty of money for um, cops and Right. So no harm to the things we really care about. More local control. More local control. For the okay. kids. Better for the kids. Better for the kids. Okay. So you get the idea? So what we're going to do is, for each of you who wants to play, is we're going to do three-minute segments instead of two. Now keep in mind, as you need to practice this game. If, if you really want to become an effective communicator, you got to practice this because you got to learn to say this in a lot less time. You really do. Okay. But three, so three minutes is a good place to start just for practice. So who would like to be the first person who plays today? Come on up. Ruth, would you like to be the interviewer? Uh, Ruth, Ruth, I would love it. Ruth Bennett is, is an elected libertarian on the uh, school board for? Continental Fancy, Alabama School District number 39. And she's running for re-election this year, another elected libertarian. And one of the best government candidates this party's ever had. Oh, God, Matt, yes. Matt in Washington State, she knows a lot about what media is typically going to ask, right? Do you want to cheat sure. sheet anyway, or do you want to just go by? Oh, let's win it. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you can sit here and be paying very close attention to whether he's driving and listen for those benefits. Three minutes. What's he running for? Yeah, so you're running for which office? For president. President, okay. And do you know which solution you're going to be focusing on? this? Abolition. Uh, of the federal government entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's <laughs> <laughs> Start small. Why not? That sounds so terrible. Is that all? What are the states? Okay, we'll get there. All right. Okay, are we ready? Go. Hello, my name is Ruth Bennett. I am interviewing today Adam McCogan, who is a candidate for president of the United States in the Libertarian Party ticket. Adam. Why are you getting into this useless endeavor? I'm running for president in order to abolish the entire federal government. It is un-American, it is contrary to the values of freedom, and when we abolish the federal government, we're going to be a lot more prosperous as a country. Every single American is going to be free of the burden that the federal government places on us today. So you think that there is no purpose whatsoever for anything the federal government does? I think without the federal government, we're going to be in a much better position as a country. Every individual is going to have the money that the federal government takes from them. They're going to get to be able to keep that. All the federal government regulations that are imposed on businesses and our communities, all of that goes away. All of the intrusions from the federal government in terms of all the other laws that they pass that violate individual rights are going to be irrelevant to our lives anymore. We're going to have much better communities and much stronger individual lives. What about national defense? So who's, going to, who's going to defend this country? Well, it's a very interesting question, but your question is based on a false premise that the 
the United States military actually makes us safer, when in fact it makes us less safe. And so when we abolish the federal government, we're going to find much better ways of interacting with the rest of the world in peace and prosperity and free trade, rather than with war and with the military. And so we're going to so not be causing... Are you proposing doing away with the U.S. Constitution? I'm proposing that we see local governance to replace no, centralized question. government. Are you proposing? It sounds to me like the proposal is to do away with the, with the U.S. Constitution. Well, it's a document. It's going to exist. But as long as there is nobody there to abuse it as the institution of the United States federal government, we're going to be a lot better off as a country. So the founding fathers were wrong when they, when they tried to set up even a limited government. I think what they were looking for was something that was based on the values of freedom, and it's clearly gotten out of control. Abolishing the federal government will get us much closer to the values that they were attempting to stand up for, and I think the system they designed was for much smaller populations rather than the country of 320-something million that we live in today. So I think they had a lot of great intent, they had a lot of important values, but the way we live up to that heritage, you know, the way we stand up to the values of the American values, is to abolish the American federal government. Um, but who, the, the effect, one thing the federal government does is, is to try to protect the rights of people that are, that are incapable of protecting themselves. So we're talking in some cases the elderly, in some cases um, the physically handicapped, the mentally handicapped. Um, uh, so there, there are a number of those kinds of protections that the federal government has in place. So what about those kinds of people? Well, its attempts have clearly failed, and right now, as a result, people are worse off under those programs. I think if we really want to help well, I, people... You know, I, I, don't, I, mean, I, I, I don't necessarily see that. I mean, my, my mom exists because only because of Social Security. All right, time. Let's get it. Yeah. Somebody jump up and want to do it. 
Oh, yeah. Actually, I want, I, I think yeah. someone could do an even better job than Michael did. Yeah. Because yeah. Michael was trying to throw them off and ask questions that can, were. How about we have Adam? Can we do one? After, after you do it, then you do the answer. This often happens to the people uh, who are revenge who have. <laughs> <laughs> Constitute the common law grand juries. Anybody ever heard of that? What does that mean? The common law grand juries? Yeah. Uh, uh, they were in every courthouse in the 30s, and they can only issue a true bill uh, for a political, elected, or public official, no civilians, opposed to the statutory grand jury. I'm going to interrupt you right okay. there. <laughs> Just the amount of time it took you to do that explanation, and how many people know what he means yet? <laughs> okay, it's going to take you the whole two, three minutes just to explain this one. Want me to pick another one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I'm running for uh, Orange County Commissioner, and uh, I, one of my things would be is to get rid of Common Core. Common Core. Uh, oh, okay. good. Do you have the authority to do that as a county commissioner? Yes. All right, good. Okay. All right, three minute time, we're ready to go? And go. Let's go. Why are you running for this position? Uh, I, I think one of the things I must do as a parent employer is uh, get rid of Common Core coming into Orange County. How does this affect you as an employer? Uh, well, it's just too expensive and it's basically unconstitutional. So as an employer, we're still using too much of our time and our resources. Isn't Common Core just a means of communicating standards that we should all be held to for education? What Common Core does is take the decision making from the parents on testing and education of their children and sends it up to, it comes from the uh, United States or Agenda 21. Well, you've seen how far that's gone with homeschooling. Do you really think parents should be trusted with the education of their children? Well, uh, if you're going to try to compare the, uh, the parents with the um, uh, government, well, we all know who would win there. So the parents definitely are smarter than the government. Well, I don't think most parents in America trust the government to educate their children. I mean, why would you want to damage that trust? Because if we don't take back the teaching and education of our children, they may end up like our parents, where they're uneducated and they don't understand the Constitution. Are you not going for the parents' vote now? You think you think parents are uneducated? Uh, I think they're naive about what's going on with Common Core. So the people who are you're asking for their vote, you're you're saying that they're naive now. Uh, well, I think they're just uneducated about what's happening with Common Core and how it actually affects everything in this country. Well, speaking of trust, do you think they're going to be able to trust a candidate with a beard? <laughs> <laughs> My wife did. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> for a while. So as a, as a county commissioner, how do you actually plan to build the consensus? Is it going to be possible that you're actually going to carry out any of these changes? Actually, what I would do is reincarnate, the, uh, reconstitute the common law grand juries, and basically they could rule that the uh, common core is unconstitutional. How does that work? Um, well, uh, just like a statutory grand jury, they would issue a true bill, and then that would have to go to the state attorney. Uh, and that would be unconstitutional what the common core is. So in order for this plan to work, you have to have a, a much greater involvement of, of other officials, correct? Is that correct? I think we'd be able to publicize how basically is our, um, our county commissioners, our school board of education here in Orange County have been bribed by the money coming down from Rick Scott and the feds to allow in common core. So it sounds like this is a protest vote, so that if you win, you can be a protest vote on the commission. What, what can you actually accomplish? I wouldn't call it a protest vote. I think it would be initiating it so the power comes back to the people instead of initiated in centralization of the government. And Common Core, for people who really believe that this is a positive standard to hold people to, as an alternative, what do you suggest that we're going to have as a guiding principle? All right, very good. Thank you. Stay here. Thank you for coming up here. That was an interesting one. That was a hard one to, talk, to judge because it got into a lot of details and um, 
it was kind of hard to follow. So when if somebody just turned into the, tuned into the radio, there was only a couple snippets where they would have been able to find out that you were talking about getting rid of Common Core. So what you want to do is keep saying, when we get rid of Common Core, when we abolish Common Core and return the control to parents, do we come when we get rid of Common Core? Because people need to be cured this all the time. So this was, you actually, I mean, the, the general topic was on your proposal, almost all of it. So in that sense, you were driving. But in the sense of, was it leaving people with a strong sense of getting rid of Common Core as an action, it was a little murky there. Something quick? You want some good arguments against Common Core. Talk to public school teachers. They're the biggest enemies of this. Oh, yeah. We can't teach. We're not allowed to do this. It interferes with us caring for your kids. And, and saying you got their support has got to help. In, in communication of the complex terms, which really drives people crazy, and we're libertarians, we love it. So, <laughs> we challenge, we find it all the time. Uh, but particularly being able to point how it moves the decision making process closer to people so that people are making, not I'm making the decision, but rather rational, our neighbors, our local community makes the decision. That's the process. It's a complicated process. I can't explain it if you like, but it brings the decision making closer to home, and that's what's important. And, that and one of the things you can even expand on that is the parents and teachers who know and love these kids who have the most at stake in their educational outcome, they're the ones who should be making the decisions, not faraway bureaucrats in the Capitol building or in Washington, D.C. One of the things I was trying to divert you on to make your, as, a, as a being antagonistic was, well, you just insulted an entire portion of the people you're asking about. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you to do it with my Maggie? And then you yeah. two more times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're not here's another word, Maggie. Yeah. They're the, not educated, so like, it's, it was like a separate trap yeah. that, that wasn't really, I thought we were talking about driving or not driving. Now, this is why well, practice is important. It's part of there, there's though. many aspects to public speaking that we need to refine, and there's many nuances of, in when you run for office and little arguments and twists and turns. The more you practice, the more you can anticipate those. You can find out things you don't want to say, like that all parents are a little uneducated today. Like you know, so that's, that's, yeah, you want to be you want to be careful. And in fact, it's just not true. There's plenty of very smart and well-educated parents out there who, as you point out, are more qualified than the government to teach their kids. So, um, okay. So this one was a tough one to judge. Um, and I'm not sure I was holding up the card right at all times. It, it was hard for me to judge. That given that, uh, what? Let's throw out some numbers. What percentage of the time would you say he was driving? Seventy-five. Seventy-five. Seventy. Other numbers? Forty. Yes. I mean, I. I couldn't. I couldn't make it out. Like, who was the car? Yeah, that was kind of my sense also. It was. It was hard to judge. I'm going to say it was somewhere oh, around. It was somewhere between forty and sixty-five, but I don't know where. Okay. So in a general sense, you were driving, and and you also kept him on topic. Your questions are when when you come up here, it's, it's a good exercise. When you do this back in your home space, which I strongly encourage you to. You want to knock the off track because this is what happens in interviews. They don't lay out the red carpet and talk about what you want to talk about. Trust me, especially in a debate, you have to really work at getting them on your message. So it's, it's good practice to, you know, throw these completely irrelevant questions that happen all the time. Now, benefits. What benefits did you hear him say that you remember? We talked about it afterwards, but how are the people? The people? Something about parents having more control. Yeah. Yes. Better education. Better education. Local decisions. So on uh, 0 to 20, what would you give yourself if 20 was the very best you could impress people with benefits, and 0 was none at all, where do you think you'd go then? Okay, I would put it a little less than that. I, you want it, you want it to be clean. You want people to be if it's murky, then people don't really get it. You want it to be crystal clear. Okay? So there's some room for improvement there. But generally you did a good job putting it out there. I would recommend getting some coaching about when you start talking about setting up the what was it? The common the, the uh, common old brain jury, which most people don't have a clue about. That that hurts my brain. I'm sure I could understand it if I took a 
moment. And, you but, and I'm sure I would. <laughs> but the problem with that on the camp, look at the reaction that you got. People were confused. It took up a lot of time. You just don't have the time. So you're better picking things that are really simple and easy. Well, even that, if I may, could be boiled down to we're going to create a justice system based on real crimes, not victimless crimes. By the way, if you want to know how I'm going to but do how, that, but, then you have to, answer, but you also have to tie that into where did that victimless crimes commission is? Well, that's just the off the top of my head, but I mean that there's a, yeah, there's a, there's system, there's a way of boiling it down. Simple. Yeah. Yes, and you need to look for finding those ways to say it's simple. Yes. One of your jobs as a candidate is to educate not only uh, the, the news reporter, but the people on your city council, the county board of supervisors. Ruth Bennett, with her school board position, had one of the other board members say, are you going to be running for re-election? And she was surprised when the woman said, you bring a point of view to here that we don't hear very often, and it's refreshing, and it makes me a better school board member. Is that not correct, Ruth? Yay. So you can do that as a candidate. Well, that's where the militias are called up for. 
And, and the militias would go into the Afghanistan. Militias are supposed to execute the laws of the land, suppress insurrection, that were the and, and, So we don't need to fund our, our outrageous military. What about the poor people? How are they going to survive? Actually, well, the poor people get more money because they're not paying anything. I mean, but what about the mothers can come homeschool their children, those who want to come home. So you're saying get rid of the school system? Oh, that would be a good advantage, yes. I mean, our education system is already proven to be bankrupt. It's yeah, but what, what do you do about the people that don't have the parents that may have the wherewithal of it? Co ops. You can create homeschooling co ops. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Oh, okay, now. This was at times a little hard to judge, but more clear. Um, what percentage of the time did you see the gold price up in the air? Less than 50%. Uh, what did you guys think? What, throw out numbers. I thought it was at least, I thought it was at least 60, yeah. What did you guys think? Throw out numbers. 60. 60? Not bad. Not bad. And now what benefits do you remember him saying with this solution? $11,500. That and it was a little unclear as to what he was talking about to me, but he hasn't had time to practice, so we'll let that go. 11,000, what, what else did you hear? One parent can stay home. Parent can stay yeah. home. Comes to the Anything else? Collecting taxes. Pardon me? Employers collecting taxes. They won't have to do that Okay. I think that was sort of inferred. I don't know. Four people keep their money. money. Pardon me? Four people keep their money. Four people keeping their money. On a scale of 0 to 20, and 20 was like the most brilliant job you could have done getting out the benefits, and 0 was not mentioning them at all. Where do you think these do? Well, what do you guys think? Honestly. 10, 12. 10, 12. Okay. You certainly made an effort. I, I'd say part of it was because you just, it needs more preparation, and things just weren't clear. So part of it was just because it wasn't totally clear what you were talking about. You were clearly making an effort to do that. So I would say 10, it might have been a little bit more. If I may, just about this in particular, it, it was a lot of good libertarian messaging, but it's sort of like, oh, so don't you believe that all drugs should be legal? Oh, so don't you believe there should be no law about this? Oh, don't you believe there should be, and instead of bringing it back to like, yes. hey, this is our most popular selling point, we can end the income tax, you let the interviewer take you to less popular positions. Yeah. 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 So you did on purpose, so you were more challenged here, and you were tempted or something that you suggested. That, that's a tough one, because you don't want to say, no, we're not ever going to get rid of the schools. Maybe we will privatize them someday, okay? <laughs> but you, you, can, you can redirect, again, you want to practice this. And, and look at that, your packet there where it talks about redirect. I believe we have more downstairs, by the way, so if you didn't get one of these, stop by the registration desk and ask for one. I'm sorry about not having them in the room here. Um, what but, are they called? But you can, you can, I'm sorry? What are they called? Um, these, oh, Who's driving, driving car in front of Who's driving handouts that look like this, okay? Um, so I thought, given that you didn't have time to practice, you did a, a really fine job. And I thank you for coming to your place. So thank you both. <laughs>
All right. Who else can be our timer? Since we are busy. What are you running for, sir? I'm running for North Carolina. It's Brian Lewis. Brian Lewis. And North Carolina General Assembly House District. All right. And what's the main proposal that you want to sell? And my largest concern for the state is the restriction on the market for environmental solutions. So how do we help our environment by using the forces of the market to give us the best ideas and getting the state out of the way, restricting them for Sounds like a challenging one. It's going to be complicated. Are you ready for that? To get that out, explain in a short amount of time, and get the benefits out. It's my goal. All right, well, we'll try it. We'll try it. We'll do it right. All right. Okay, you ready to go for three minutes? Let's go. Hi. Uh, explain to me why you're running as a libertarian. I believe that the market forces that uh, have shown the prosperity that we have in the United States today bring great ideas, the innovation that's brought to the market has really benefited the whole world. And I want those forces applied to larger problems that we see in it's our really communities. It's benefited the whole world. It seems to me that it benefits some people and other people just stagnate. By all metrics, the world today, because of liberalizing markets, open markets, free exchange of ideas, free exchange of uh, goods through trade, have improved the quality of life, have reduced the absolute poverty in the world, and in our own lifetimes, we will see an end of absolute poverty. Well, actually, the uh, so the discrepancy between the, you know the wealthy and the poor, um, as it grows greater all the time. So you know, I think if, from what we hear about uh, libertarians, they're very much uh, um, they they want people to be able to keep their own wealth rather I'm, than, than I'm actually very fond. I'm, I'm actually very fond of the statement that uh, Lady Margaret Thatcher had made, uh, uh, the Prime Minister in front of the House of Commons, regarding that you'd rather the poor be poor so long as the rich are the richer. And, and I disagree with the notion. Uh, accumulations of wealth don't naturally sustain themselves. They don't naturally sustain themselves generation, generationally. And so by allowing them, folks to have their money actually creates better markets create actually better investment opportunities for good ideas. And the philanthropy that we see from people who use their own money to steer in directions that help the community at large are wonderful. So, yeah, but let's take a specific, like, uh, you, know, you know, before Obamacare, I had, my whole neighborhood couldn't afford to, uh, you know, their, their kid had uh, the flu and had to sit for an hour, and you have to sit for hours in an emergency room. She so needed the government. Well, I, I primarily, uh, don't agree with the, the direction because it presumes that we have free market in existence or free market in place prior to Obamacare, uh, where uh, the focus that I'm looking at is how we use market forces on environmental issues, how we use market forces so that the many good ideas that we have for many problems, anywhere from global warming to water quality to water supply, that the free market is able to find solutions and bring them available at better cost than what government is. And so you're saying we should trust free markets like those Exxon people that just spill oil all over the place? And, <laughs> and again, just like the Obamacare preference, I would say that the environment that you describe these problems as existing in uh, as though it was a free market. And it actually wasn't a free market. It was a very modified and manipulated market. That modification and manipulation exists as an inhibited. Okay, very interesting. Now, I don't know if you saw the cards out there. Did you see the cards out there? Yes, I did. But I, I feel like this this is what you're going to deal with when you're yes. dealing with the press. Now, yeah, yeah. now, what was the problem? What was the fundamental problem? The, the red cards were up most of the time, or should have been. What was the, part, what was the fundamental problem here? It's an isolation. You weren't driving. And what do we mean by driving? What does he mean? Yeah, yeah. No, no, he means he was in control in a lot of ways. So people by a lot of meetings. Benefits. What was he not talking about? His topic. What about his topic? There was no specific solution. Specific solutions. Now, the way you were talking, you are articulate. You know a lot about it. it would have been a great lecture for libertarians. 
atmosphere. For preaching to the choir, as we said, explaining the principles of liberty. But for the everyday voter, first of all, they're not really, it was actually pretty educational for someone who wasn't a libertarian. It was, it was, you made a lot of good points. But there was no specific proposal that I heard, not one. Did, am I wrong? I, I mean, there was some where you're sort of suggesting, and you were talking about the benefits of them, quite a bit. But the benefits of what? So the problem with that is that you could have been a Republican saying a lot of what you said. Or you could have been, I don't know. <laughs> These sell usually for $15 each, plus shipping, it'll come to like $35. I'm giving you a 43% discount. You get them both together for one $20 bill with a money-back guarantee. 
My guarantee is if you try these out and you don't keep getting better and better results, next time you run into me, even if you're not carrying the book, say, I didn't get it and I'll give you your money back. That's how sure I am you can do this well. How well do I know this? I've gotten notes from Mary Reward. I've gotten notes from people at Cato. I've gotten notes from people at Reason Magazine. I've gotten notes from people like Harry Brown. I've gotten notes from people like Charles Murray telling me that they use this stuff. I want you to be better than our competitors, don't you? And this is why I want to give you this deal. I've got exactly eight sets of these books left. So if you want to be one of the people, hold up a $20 bill, and I'll autograph them later if you want. Now, if you think that that will destroy the value of the book, please ask me if I will. Is there a way they can order them if you run out here today? If I run out, we're going to be going into a reprinting of next year, so you know my magnum opus will come out. And that's, that's the book beyond these, and it's called Libertarian Persuasion, a Marketplace, not a Battlefield. And that will be, be step available. by step. It'll be available next year. That'll be available next year. Do we have, we don't have more people. And uh, that'll be advertised through the Libertarian Party as well as through Advocates for Self-Government and a couple others. They are great books. Is there anybody else? Yes. Is there anywhere online you can buy them? Um, Advocates has my second book, but they don't have my first book which is going out of print this weekend. Okay. And then it's going to go back into print, re-edited. All right, I'm sorry for those of you that we, we didn't bring it up. Uh, no. so. I couldn't carry as many as I wanted to. OK, so. thank you all for coming. Um, if you guys can come in the front of the room, we're waiting to. Oh, yes, I would like to play.